was that there are actual slave auctions being held right now in 2017 in Libya. The footage shows auctioneers yelling for these people to buy these big strong men that can work on the farm, uh, selling them for hundreds of dollars for the most fit of the bunch. Uh, but these are refugees and migrants who are trying to flee their conditions in Africa. Uh, they're trying to make their way into Europe via the Mediterranean. These human traffickers pick them up. There's thousands arriving every single day and they get stuck in Libya. Now either these human traffickers never intended to get them all the way to the Europe in the first place or uh, these people end up not being able to foot the bill for the rest of the journey or their family can't pay the money to get them back. So they end up in debt to these human traffickers who are then selling them off as slaves. And now we actually have a former Nigerian uh, minister making some shocking claims. This is Femi Fani Kayode. Uh, he's a former Nigerian government minister claiming that these victims are having their bodies mutilated and roasted like shish kebabs. He's claiming that they're having their organs harvested after being sold into slavery in Libya. These are dire conditions. This is, it's so disgusting. Um, but actually, you see in Libya, they're using President Trump's tweets. Some of, some of the news outlets there in uh, Libya are saying that this is a report coming from CNN. And even the president of the U.S. calls CNN fake news news because they're wanting to question the report's credibility. So that's kind of a shocker there. Uh, but this guy is calling out uh, Nigeria's president for ignoring the slavery that's going on right now. Uh, but he's also bemoaning the overthrow of Libyan dictator Gaddafi, which is, of course, what led to this entire chaos in the first place, this humanitarian crisis. Obviously, orders have been given that it is Time to throw the Clintons to the wolves. This is an article coming out of USA Today this week. Africans are being sold at Libyan slave markets. Thanks, Hillary Clinton. Now, if you're a regular reader of InfoWars, then you know we've been calling out Hillary Clinton for her strategic error uh, for many years, but it was her decision um, as Secretary of State. She spearheaded the operation that went in to take out Gaddafi. And ever since NATO backed forces overthrew him in 2011, the country has been beset by chaos. We know now that that overthrow was a massive strategic debacle. Uh, the country was thrust into chaos, civil war, massive refugees flooding Europe, destabilizing governments, and also we have terrorist groups trying to move in and take over that power vacuum that was created. But at the time, Hillary Clinton is just saying what a triumph it was. Yes, we came. We saw, he died. <laughs> now, the long-term humanitarian repercussions of that decision are obvious. But this article points out that that decision to go in and overthrow Gaddafi is now going to limit our options with North Korea and Iran. Now, back in 2003, George W. Bush, uh, they made a deal with Gaddafi. They said, look, if you give up your weapons arsenal, your weapons of mass destruction, give them up peacefully, and we will not depose you. He announced this back in 2003 that he had agreed to give up his arms. Well, the Obama administration, for whatever reason, decided not to stick with that deal, and then Hillary Clinton spearheaded this operation to topple Gaddafi anyway. Many people were very concerned when President Obama was part of making this Iran nuclear deal, saying, look, we're going to give you billions of dollars and lift some sanctions. Just promise you won't build up your nuclear arsenal and pointed at the U.S. or its allies. And of course, Iran is threatening to do just that. They are threatening to increase the ballistic missile range so that they can reach Europe. Um, this is pretty similar to exactly what happened with Bill Clinton's North Korea deal. Uh, he also said that North Korea would dismantle its nuclear program, everything would work out fine. So then North Korea says, well, screw you, and then they go back to making a nuclear arsenal. So we can see how this is just really dangerous when you're dealing with this despotic regimes, but now these regimes have no reason to believe that the United States is going to stick to their end of the bargain because they keep re reneging on these deals. And North Korea now coming out saying that a breakthrough has put the entire U.S. mainland within range of its nuclear weapons. People are saying, you know, can President Trump still negotiate with North Korea? Welcome back.
You're at the War Room with my colleagues Rob Dew and Owen Schroyer. I'd refer to them as my comrades, but that could get us investigated for Russian collusion. Stunning news today covered on the Alex Jones show earlier today in the guilty plea by former Trump national security advisor Michael Flynn. But the mainstream media reports on this are not exactly right. You see, last week, it was reported that Flynn's attorneys broke off their relationship and their uh, communications with the president's attorneys. And many, many read that as a sign that Flynn was turning on the president. We can now exclusively report that it was exactly the other way around, that the president's attorneys broke off their communications with the Flynn camp. General Flynn, who spent his entire life in the service of his country as a soldier, not a politician, not a diplomat, but a military man, is virtually penniless. He never built any wealth while serving his country, unlike so many in the Obama administration. And therefore, the intense financial pressure uh, and the threat of going after one of the general's sons has brought this great and patriotic American to his knees. Now, the charge is an interesting one, that he allegedly lied to the FBI uh, regarding a contact with the Russians for the purposes of setting up a dialogue. Let's recognize that such an activity by General Flynn or even by the president himself or the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, would be perfectly legal. In fact, part of their job description. Do we have to remind the libtards in the mainstream media that the Russians have thermonuclear weapons and therefore a continuing dialogue with them is a good idea? The Obama administration had their reset with the Russians, an ignominious failure. In the meantime, little did we know, Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, with the Obama administration looking the other way, we're selling 20% of our strategic uranium to a company controlled by Putin. There's the scandal. Oh no, we're indicting Mike Flynn because when the FBI raided his office in a surprise raid directed by Andrew McCabe, uh, the deputy director of the FBI, well, it is alleged that Flynn uh, misled the FBI about his contacts with the Russian ambassador. The president, in my opinion, is getting terrible legal advice. Cutting off General Flynn was a mistake. And this is very clear that uh, Mr. Mueller is headed for an indictment of the president uh, for who knows, something procedural, obstruction, perjury, or some other bogus claim. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Rob, Owen, oh, wasn't this about Russian collusion? What did I miss? Well, that's what they always want to say, is that it's about Russian collusion. And then when they start investigating, they go, well, no, we have no Russian collusion, so we got to make something up. we got to find something. And, oh, Flynn didn't say he gave us the wrong date. Who knows what they're going to say Flynn really lied about. It could have been a wrong date. It could have been who he met with. It, it could have been anything. But it's not... It doesn't have anything to do with Russian collusion. And then we got James Clapper, who flat out lied to Congress, said they don't grab people's data, cell phone data, uh, computer data, email data. And he, he flat out lied, just flat out lied to the American people and Congress. Now, where is the Clapper indictment? Exactly right. He testified before the Congress that the federal government had no metadata collection system. And that was proven to be false when Edward Snowden came forward. Funny how there's a different standard for the Trump officials than there were for the Obama administrations. And then there is the sleazy role of former CIA director James Woolsey in all of this. Woolsey and Flynn were friendly, yet Woolsey ran to Vice President Joe Biden's office where he met with Susan Rice and uh, 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 Ben Rhodes of the National 
uh, NSA under Obama to tell them a tall tale about Mike Flynn uh, working with the Turkish government to illegally extradite a rogue cleric holding out in the Pennsylvania Poconos uh, who the Turkish government uh, believes staged an unsuccessful coup in an attempt to overturn that very government. Woolsey uh, is bearing false witness against Flynn. Flynn's associates assure me in the strongest possible terms that he was never a party to any discussion to illegally kidnap and extradite anyone. But Woolsey was. Woolsey and his exceedingly greedy young wife are driving a false narrative, upset that the Turks engaged Mike Flynn in what is a perfectly legal representation and now smearing him saying that Flynn was working on a plot to uh, kidnap and extradite an enemy of the Turkish government. Woolsey's role in all of this was first brought to light by Infowars. No other media outlet in the country has brought you the detail of this deep staters act of subversion and the uh, okie doke he is performing on General Flynn a great but beleaguered American. That's right, Roger. And it, it, I just love the double standard that is happening right now. I was scanning through my tweets while I was listening to you and someone showed me the picture of Flynn agreeing to be to plead guilty. And yes, nobody's denying he pleaded guilty to anything. But what is he guilty of right now? He pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. That's all he pleaded guilty to. He didn't plead guilty to Russian collusion, which I don't even think is a crime. He didn't plead guilty to being a spy. And it probably doesn't even have to do with Russia. It looks like it has to do with instances of him talking with Turkish officials. That's what it looks like. Yeah, isn't it interesting? This fits a pattern. They indict Paul Manafort for things that are completely unrelated to the Trump campaign or, uh, or Russia. They indict his associate, Rick Gates, similarly. They uh, try to elevate this guy, Papadopoulos, yeah. who is not a member of the Trump senior staff, who has no authority in the Trump campaign, who is a member of a 100-member foreign policy volunteer advisory committee, uh, who has one session with the president, but they try to dress him up as a Trump foreign policy advisor. He sends a bunch of inane emails saying, oh, we should meet with the Russians. Paul Manafort specifically says in an email, this is a bad idea. Cut this guy off. Close this committee. We're not doing anything of the kind. Mueller has that email. You won't read about it anywhere, of course. Uh, this is all a propped up effort to get the president of the United States. That said, the president is receiving terrible legal advice. If his lawyers told him to cut off General Flynn, he has made an egregious error. I pray that our president understands that he is the ultimate target of this misguided smear campaign to bring him down on some bogus charge like perjury or obstruction when there is no underlying crime. Communications with the Russians by the president or his national security advisor or his son-in-law who serves on the White House staff is perfectly legal, indeed appropriate. I Rob, totally, uh, totally it, it's agree. almost hard to know where to start on this. I yeah. mean, the phone is just blowing up with reporters, but none of them seem to understand the falseness of this entire approach. No, they want to go after you. Like I read the email that we got yesterday from some New York Daily News writer who was concerned about videos on YouTube. Not concerned about anything else and not issues of substance. And it, it turned out to be fake, too. It was just a big fake news. It's just a fake news factory coming out from the mainstream media. So we'll have more about that on the other side of this break. This is Rob Dew, Roger Stone. You're watching The War Room. Welcome back. That says it all, doesn't it? Giant nothing burger. The mainstream media looks the other way. Joining me now in the new New York Bureau of Infowars is Tyler Nixon, California attorney, published author, uh, libertarian activist, and longtime tracker of the deep state. 
Tyler has done an analysis on Robert Mueller and his conflicts, and he's going to fill us in now. Tyler, sure. welcome to InfoWars. Good to be with you all. Uh, Robert Mueller is a member of the bar, obviously, in numerous, uh, probably in numerous states. But the bottom line is this. You have attorneys cannot take cases in which there is an appearance of a conflict of interest. It doesn't matter whether you can resolve the conflict of interest or even get the party's consent, which in this case you can't because, you know, one of the parties is a potential prosecution uh, uh, subject. So in this case, you would have Mueller, who really should have recused himself. He should never have taken this appointment in the first place uh, because there is a huge appearance of impropriety. His connections to the FBI, his uh, work as a government attorney prior to this, his work under the Bush administration as well as Clinton's, uh, all of that is relevant to, I think, the analysis of whether he could objectively pursue an investigation against a president in such a partisan environment, no less. Uh, it really is a shame that he he has ultimately tainted it. But unfortunately, what we have is a lot of the deep state protectionists sandbagging Mueller's appointment. You know, uh, Lindsey Graham on today talking about Mueller's doing his job. And that's not helping matters because it really reinforces the fact that you can avoid, you can uh, neglect and ignore what are real conflicts of interest, what are obviously, uh, you know, Mueller's investigation reflects that he is uh, he does have an agenda. He clearly does have a bias. Um, he is going after the lowest. It's not even hanging fruit. I mean, it's literally on the ground scattered, uh, the type of stuff he's getting into in this investigation. And he's he's, he's chasing down uh, effectively ghosts and uh, shadows in order to justify the multi-million dollars he spent in putting together this uh, Hillary donation crew that he's got uh, running out of Northern Virginia there. Uh, you know, Robert Mueller should be frankly, char not charged, but he should be brought up for disciplinary uh, uh, review with whatever state bar he is a member of, which I'm, I'm looking into as well, because the bottom line is when he actually took this appointment, they did a, they did a, a what's called a conflicts check with his firm at the time, which is Wilmer Hale. Now, they found out, of course, that the Trump family members are clients of Wilmer Hale, and they said, well, that doesn't matter, you know, and he passed this review. Who cares what Robert Mueller did as a rainmaking attorney, you know, post-government attorney. What matters is his 30 years as a government attorney, as a head of the FBI, as uh, a U.S. attorney. Those connections are what matter. Those are the conflicts of interest that should have been vetted and reviewed. But we're supposed to just take the word of Rod Rosenstein and whoever else, uh, you know, supports Miller and his uh, crusade, his jihad. And I, I think there ought to be a deep review. And if we, you know, they know they don't want to do that review because it would reveal so many connections, particularly to James Comey, that he wouldn't have been qualified. He would have had to recuse himself, not because he might have a direct conflict of interest, like he was, uh, you know, Mueller's support or more, uh, excuse me, Comey was his subordinate, but because there's an appearance of impropriety. And the fact that it's even being raised as an issue means, yes, there is an appearance of impropriety. He should have never taken the appointment, and frankly, it should be pursued. And I plan to look into it and take it a little further, Roger. You know, I in all honesty, Tyler, I think the inspector general at the Justice Department needs to examine the inexorable leaks coming out of the special prosecutor's office. Part of the problem here is the fact that we don't have a special prosecutor law in place that governs the activities of Mr. Mueller. That law has expired and not been renewed. Under that law, for example, a special counsel had to clear with the attorney general his an expansion of his probe. But there are no such restraints on Mr. Mueller. He can root through Paul Manafort's closet, taking pictures of his clothing. He can say in an indictment that Paul Manafort lives a lavish lifestyle, implying that he has evaded taxes, but bringing not a single tax evasion charge against Manafort. Manafort's lawyers tell me he has paid every dime that he owes on money coming into the country. They smear him with tax, uh, pardon me, with money laundering. Well, money has to be dirty before you can launder it. Money paid to Manafort by a legitimate political party in Ukraine in a democratic election, the result of which was recognized by our State Department is by definition not dirty or illegal money. It would have to be taxed if brought into the country. I'm told Manafort paid his taxes on any funds that he utilized in the United States. Notice that there's no charge of Russian collusion in the charges against Manafort or his associates. 
What do you think, Tyler? An effort to squeeze Manafort to testify against the president? Well, absolutely. And the thing is, these are these are charges that a U.S. attorney, a junior U.S. attorney, uh, a junior prosecutor, federal prosecutor, would never lodge. They would never see these as worthy of pursuing, worthy of the assets and resources of the federal government. They would ultimately be left to the side and handled some other way. But that's how you got these gotcha violations that Mueller is t attempting to use to squeeze uh, you know, squeeze the potential witnesses against the president. This is not an environment. This is not a mafia operation where clearly everybody's dirty and you're just trying to get people to avoid being prosecuted for real crimes. This is a political, highly charged context. To say you can squeeze somebody at that level, facing potentially what 20 years of uh, 20 years of imprisonment, of course, that you could get almost probably get anybody to say anything at that stage. These are not mafia dons. It's a totally wrong environment to attempt to, quote, put the squeeze on anybody. What they ought to be putting the squeeze on is Hillary's uh, extended operation. So, All right. Uh, now is a great time to remind you uh, that uh, the only news outlet in the country today bringing you the stone cold truth about the Flynn indictment is InfoWars. And we are only here today because of the loyal support of info warriors like you, which is why I ask you to go now to the InfoWars store and to load up on some of these extraordinary Christmas specials that Alex Jones has slashed prices on. 67% on Silver Bullet, the very best colloidal silver formula on the market today. 50% on Brain Force Plus. Folks, buy a case of this and give it to your liberal friends. They need it. They could use a little more brain power. Or Survival Shield at 50% off. Uh, Secret 12, Super Male Vitality. These are extraordinary, carefully tested, fully vetted. And uh, if you go online, you'll see literally in some cases, thousands of satisfied testimonials from patriots like you who realize they can not only get the very best products of this genre, the best all natural formulas, books, t-shirts, and other First Amendment oriented paraphernalia, and they can help fund our expansion here at InfoWars. We are the cutting edge. Soros wants to close us down. Google wants to silence us. Twitter wants to cut off our heads. Help us go to the InfoWars store now. This is the quintessential fight for our future. This is the fight over the future of Western civilization. And we are a beacon of truth. Alex Jones insists on two sources for everything we report, which is why we bring you the truth. Folks, now is the time. We'll be right back. You're back on the war room and sitting in for Owen Schroyer is my colleague, Rob Dew. Rob has an extraordinary report that we have just seen on the Washington Post. Rob? Exactly. Uh, FBI, this is back in January 23rd. FBI reviewed Flynn's calls with the Russian ambassador and found nothing illicit. And this basically goes back to the calls they were making before Trump took office and leading up to that. And so the FBI is basically saying... Hey, there's nothing wrong here. Yet the day after they're saying he apparently lied to the FBI. <laughs> so where are we with this? What is really going on? And it, it really looks like we're looking for crooked toenails and um, and like loose threads to go after Michael Flynn because he knows where the bodies are buried. Uh, thank you for that report, Rob. Uh, we are going to be following this story very carefully. Uh, here at InfoWars, and I guarantee you over the weekend and early next week, we will bring you the truth about what is really happening behind the scenes. Yesterday here uh, on The War Room, we had an extraordinary conversation with Kevin Barry, the author of a terrific book, Vaccine Whistleblower, and Michelle Ford of the Vaccination Injury Awareness League. Today joining us is Lori Gregory of the Mom Street News, an extraordinary website. Lori Gregory is an articulate and well-informed advocate for real vaccination safety, and she joins us now from California. Lori, welcome to the War Room. Hi, Roger. Thank you so much for having me today on the show. 
Uh, we are delighted that you could join us. Um, tell us a little about your website and the incredible crusade in which you have been most effective, the fight for vaccination safety. Well, interestingly enough, I started the Mom Street Journal about nine years ago, and originally it was meant to be a platform for natural health and natural remedies. And in February of 2015, the site took a political turn because of the introduction of SB 277 in California, which is the mandatory vaccine bill, which is now a law. Uh, now, yesterday, uh, Kevin Barry uh, outlined for us massive contributions from Big Pharma to the California Democratic Party, which miraculously, coincidentally, incredibly, happened just before the passage of that draconian law, which essentially says you can't send your children to a public school unless they've been vaccinated as the government demands. Uh, this looks to me like uh, a real issue for some kind of special prosecutor. But then you live in California, uh, home state of Congressman Adam Schiff, who has sponsored a sense of the Congress resolution that literally declared that no U.S. citizen has ever been damaged by vaccinations and the government has never paid out a single farthing, not even a penny, to those who have brought claims. This boggles the mind. This is like sponsoring a resolution in the Congress that says the Holocaust never happened. There was no World War II. Uh, it, it's, it's extraordinary uh, that this career politician is so craven, so desperate for big pharma contributions that he denies the reality you see on your screen today. Lori, lay it on us. What's the truth about vaccination injuries? It's really horrific, Roger. And I'll tell you, we actually left California about three months ago because we just couldn't take the politics anymore. As parents, uh, my husband and I were horrified to see multiple egregious bills and legislation that were being introduced and being converted into law in California. SB 277 is the most egregious, but there are others that are systemically stripping away parental rights. And I'll tell you, SB 277 is even worse than what you just described. It is uh, completely ripe for the right attorney to come in and overturn it because the Constitution of California is written in such a way that says no one shall be denied access to education. And you can actually be HIV positive, you can be hepatitis B positive and still attend school. But if you don't get 22 vaccines by the age of five, you are denied access to public and private education in the state of California. So now California joins the likes of West Virginia and Mississippi, which are the other two states that have mandatory vaccine laws in order to have access to education. And by the way, both of those states, West Virginia and Mississippi, have the highest infant mortality rates of any other states in the, in, in the nation. So we've watched as this bill has rolled out into law now, uh, autism rates continue to escalate in California. People are leaving California in droves. We saw you know, the, the court case that just was ruled on last night uh, in San Francisco with uh, the you know, illegal immigrant. And I, there's just so much going wrong in California. It's, it's really horrifying. But to see Adam Schiff introducing a bill that basically just gaslights the truth is unconscionable to me. I don't understand how someone like that can keep their job because let's remember they work for us. They are our representatives. So when this whole fight emerged in California of SB 277, um, you know, I, I saw how polarizing the issue was and I saw how emotional people became because people really have been victimized by the propaganda that says vaccines are safe and effective. 
And I started to watch my community be torn apart, literally polarized on each end of the issue, which is why I decided to use my MBA and my business background and my journalism background to start digging and to find numbers because numbers don't lie and numbers take the emotionality out of it. You cannot deny what you see you know, on a spreadsheet. And that's when I started to investigate the vaccine court. Uh, tell folks where they can uh, access the Mom Street Journal. Uh, I, I think I mangled that title earlier in the program. But this is a wealth of information, folks, and I have it uh, saved in my bookmarks. Uh, but, Lori, how can people find you and how can they follow your terrific work? Well, thank you, Roger. They can go to the momstreetjournal.com. Uh, I have everything archived there. I am completely self-funded on a shoestring and I do this all in my spare time. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I, I work. Uh, so, you know, this is just uh, a way of getting the word out there to other parents who really want to understand the importance of medical freedom and the importance of natural health. Um, I used to work on Wall Street doing investor relations for biotech and pharmaceutical companies. So I know a little bit about the industry from the inside. And what I saw in terms of the profit-driven motives that are behind these global conglomerates was, was really pretty eye-opening for me. And I decided once I became a health freedom activist that it was really important to share with people what I knew about the industry and you know how we can stay aware about what's real in medical information and science and what's propaganda. And it, it's not easy to discern in this day and age. Um, one thing I know for sure, informed consent is being violated, which is part of the Nuremberg Code that was established after World War II, which says that no individual should undergo any kind of medical treatment or procedure without their consent for the risks. That Lori, means I'm that we, Lori, I'm afraid we have to end it there. Uh, we're going to ask you to come back, uh, and I urge you to go to the Mom Street Journal. Thanks for joining us. We are back at the War Room here, joining with Roger Stone, myself, Rob Dew, and our guest, Lori Martin Gregory from the, the Mom Street Journal. Basically a citizen coming out and saying, you know what? We're being lied to. And I've got to do something about it. I can't just stand by and let the government and the medical industrial complex poison myself, my children. And well, as we know, this stuff carries through our bodies, our grandchildren. So she stood up to the dangers of vaccines, which I've done my own research and gone through my own life story dealing with this stuff. And so it's good to see uh, that she's getting a chance here to talk about this on The War Room. Uh, coming up next hour, we're going to get into this little document here that I've only printed about 30 pages of, of uh, 277, which is a little annual report of all the claims, basically all the money that the federal government pays out to vaccination victims. Oh, oh, the things that they say are safe and effective? Oh, wow, look at all these. We're going to go over the entrails of this coming up in the next hour. But I did want you to know, I do want you to know right now that Roger Stone is getting i'm not even sure if he wants me to say the guy's name but he's getting some uh i think a statement from that would be one well i'm not going to say his name but he might be jumping back in with us but Lori, are you still there i am rob excellent i want to talk about senator richard pan since you're talking about R richard pan right now apparently when he first put out this bill it was like oh it's not about mandatory vaccination it's not about mandatory vaccination and uh your friend michelle ford sent me a video last night that basically contradicts that whole uh, lie that he was telling the people of California to get this bill passed. So let's play that video right now, and then we'll get your comments. Now, someone decides still vaccine is not for them. That's fine. You know, that's their decision. We're not telling them they can't have that decision. But We're not telling them they can't have that decision. We want these kids said. to go to school, and we are not taking away the parental rights to be able to make a decision. We want to be sure oh, people have an informed decision. Yeah. So 
<laughs> We're not taking away the parental right to be able to make the decision. That's about vaccination. Dr. Pan, the main purpose of the bill is to inform parents? That, Correct. Okay. I'm, I'm just yeah. trying to understand um, how do we know that parents lack information already? How do we know? I mean, maybe they, that, how do we know that they aren't informed already? Because they vaccinate their kids. That's how we know. I feel like, please. I feel like what's happening to California and the reason we have so many people here today is there's a mistrust for state government overreaching, uh, mandating what, how they raise their children. And, and so this says state government overreaching and mandating how they You've raise provided, their children. You've uh, provided counseling on uh, immunizations as part of that. And so for those uh, patients, uh, most likely it's like, okay, well, we had the discussion. I've made my decision. I know we've talked about it. Turn in the, you know, sign the form, turn it in. I've decided not to vaccinate my children. I had patients like that in my own practice. Mm, and I bet you don't like it, do you? You don't like it when people make informed decisions, do you? Senator and Pan. so when it comes to a vaccination, vaccination is really about the public's health, about public safety. Mm, yeah. uh, I authored in the state assembly a bill to ensure that parents had accurate information when they were getting their children immunized. Uh, right. I bet he shows them the insert that comes with the vaccination, too. Especially the MMR. It says we it are give you legislation that will abolish the personal belief exemption that currently allows children who have not received the required vaccinations needed to protect the public health to enroll into our schools. And there it is. It's all about control. It's State all about Senator, telling Richard you Pan what you can do with your body. Authors. He says he wants to make it nearly impossible to not get children yeah. vaccinated in California. Surrounded by parents and babies, state senators Dr. Mm -hmm. Richard Pan and Ben Allen announced legislation These are the babies that I poison. nearly all exemptions for childhood vaccine. Yeah. So Richard Pan, it was all about forcing vaccinations on babies and young children. That's what it was all about. It has nothing to do with anything else but forcing vaccinations. And, and he goes, oh, it's a, it's a bill to educate people. Lori, your uh, reaction. Well, Rob, initially the uh, video you showed was from AB 2109, which was a bill that was passed before SB 277, which basically just required uh, parents to have a conversation with their pediatrician and to sign a form saying, I've been told about vaccines and I'm declining. And so when that legislation came through, Richard Pan, who by the way is lying, He's lying to the public when he says all of that. Um, he stood up at, at UC Berkeley and said, you know, the most dangerous thing in vaccines was water. So he's a puppet. He represents an industry that is making $50 billion a year from the U.S. market alone. And unlike adults who might get a flu shot and have a reaction and can connect the dots, a baby or a newborn isn't able to communicate and let the world know that something has changed once they've received a vaccine. So the pharmaceutical industry is going after these mandates and they're using public policy as a way to increase profit. And they're doing it through puppets like Richard Pan, who is a complete liar. And if the vaccines don't have a overt reaction, say, you know, your child suddenly doesn't speak or can't walk. Well, they may have other developmental disabilities that the pharmaceutical company's ready to help you with. They got a pill for everything. They got a pill Correct. ready to push down your throat. That's right. And I actually had a, a parent during the SB 277 uh, battle who uh, shared with me that her daughter was vaccine injured. She was injured at two months with a DTaP and put in the hospital on a respirator with all kinds of breathing problems and then uh, was injured again at 12 months when she got the MMR and had to go back to the ER and be put on a respirator. And she connected the dots, she woke up. That was her red pill moment. And she's now in the vaccine court trying to get a settlement. And it will be a landmark case when she gets a settlement because it will be the first time that a vaccine injury is being awarded because of respiratory and asthma issues. She will have breathing problems the rest of her life. Ironically and sadly, the maker of the vaccines that issued, that, that caused her injury, which was Merck, also makes the prednisone, which is the drug that she takes for the injury. So, you know, they're making money coming and going. Yeah, I I'd interviewed Sherry Tenpenny many years ago, who's a, a big mm. anti-vaccination advocate 
and uh, we're just, or just parental consent and parental information advocate, I would say. And and I said, why do you think they push so many vaccines? And that was her answer. And she goes, they they want lifelong customers, and if they can create conditions that aren't debilitating, but you need drugs to take care of them to manage them, well, they've created a lifelong customer. And she believes, and I believe that as well, that this is what's going on with so many vaccines being pushed, being produced, being created to get them in to these kids at young ages. So then they have that uh, endless money pit, as they say, because they always got in, we've got more insurance. Insurance will cover this. We have all the insurance in the world that'll keep, you know, be around for more uh, pharmaceuticals and treatments for these young children as they grow up. And allergies are off the charts. Uh, developmental delays are off the charts. ADHD is off the charts. And no one seems to know what the problem is. No one has any answers. It couldn't be the precious vaccine industry. We could never question them because we've been told they're safe and effective. Yet, as we're going to discuss in the next hour, hundreds of millions of dollars is paid out every year to families of young children who've been injured by these. And adults, too. That's right. And, and as you and yeah, go ahead, Roger. Uh, with uh, about a little less than two minutes to go, I, I, I want to wrap this up by saying, and I know you agree with this, Lori. It's essential that President Trump follow through on his pledge to appoint a blue ribbon commission headed by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., son of former U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy of New York, to explore the safety of vaccinations. The president's instincts on this issue are right. He has publicly expressed his concern about the massive number of vaccinations and about ma uh, uh, government mandated vaccinations. So I know you join me and all advocates in calling on the president to keep your pledge. Appoint the Kennedy Commission now and let's get to the bottom of vaccination safety. I want to thank you myself for joining us here. Uh, and I again want to commend the Mom Street Journal. Thank my colleague Rob Dew for jumping into the breach. Uh, and thank you all for coming to the War Room. And folks, for your last minute Christmas shopping, again, I urge you to go to the Infowars.com store. Look at the t shirts, look at the books, look at the outstanding, all natural products that we have there. This is the engine that keeps InfoWars on the cutting edge of the vaccination issue and all the issues. But we can't do it without listener and viewer support. So do your Christmas shopping here at InfoWars. Lori, Rob, thanks for a terrific show. And we'll be back on The War Room.